So in the last video, we talked about how you can accelerate the custom processor generated by a high-level synthesis tool by finding independent instructions in the same basic block and scheduling them in the same cycle. So we ended up for our simple program that's iterating over a loop, adding seven to every entry, getting a finite state machine that looks kind of like this. You have an entry state, and then you have these green states, which are the loop body. And then when the loop body finishes, you jump back or you go to the end state. And this is a lot better than what we did originally, but there's another critical optimization that we can do, and that's pipelining. So in this video, we're really gonna get into the essence of what pipelining is. So if you remember, the way the instructions are laid out in this state machine, this is just an entry state. Um, and then in this state, we start loading a value from memory. And then in state three, we finish loading the value from memory and add seven to it and start storing it. And then the store continues in state four because the store um, doesn't finish until uh, two cycles later. And then in this final state of the loop, state five, we finish doing the store instruction and then we branch either back to the start of this loop to do another iteration of the loop or to the end of the program. But if you think about the way this branch works, what it depends on, we could actually, you know, um, do something very different that improves uh, and optimizes this program a lot. So if you think about the data dependencies of this branch instruction, it only depends on the value of exit cond. As soon as we know the value of exit cond, we know where this branch is going to take us to. Well, exit cond itself is just an equality comparison between the value 6 and the number 10, which is the loop bound. And the number 6 is just the loop index variable incremented by 1. And the loop index variable is just the result of this phi instruction. And the phi instruction you can think of as just being a mux, which either chooses the value 0 if we jumped to this basic block from uh, label 0, which is the entry label, or if it chooses the label 6, which is the incremented loop index, if we came from the, another iteration of the same loop. And so, as I've noted down here, we could actually compute the next basic block to execute in the first state of this loop, or in the first state in the state machine uh, that corresponds to this basic block. Because all of these are operations that only take combinational time. You know, an integer comparison, an add, and a phi, or a multiplexer, um, can all be done inside of a cycle. So actually, here's a radical idea, and this is the essence of pipelining. Instead of branching in state five, let's branch in state two, right? Let's just do the branch in the first state of the loop. So what would that executing this actually look like, this new finite state machine? Well, in state zero, we would, uh, of course, be in cycle zero, or in cycle zero, we'd be in state zero because that's the start state. Now with that state active, we'd then in the next state transition to state two. And here's where things get interesting. In state two, the loop branch condition is going to evaluate to false. We're not going to exit the loop yet because we just jumped to the first iteration of the loop and the loop has 10 iterations. So the second iteration of the loop has got to happen before we finish. Right, so we're going to jump from state two back to state two and state two has an unconditional transition marked by T or true from two to three. So we're actually going to execute two transitions and have two states be active in the next cycle. So in the next cycle, we're going to have another instance of state 2 be active and state 3 is going to be active. So in the second cycle, we've got state 3 active, which corresponds to the continuation of the first iteration of the loop. And we're going to have another instance of state 2 active corresponding to the start of the second state of the loop. Now, because state 2 and state 3 are both active, well, state 3 has an unconditional transition to state 4. So in the next uh, state, state 4 is going to be active. And state two has an unconditional transition to state three. So in the next state, state three is going to be active. And state two has an, a possible transition either to one or to itself. But because this instance of state two is the second iteration or the start of the second iteration of a loop that has 10 iterations, we're going to jump, exit cond is going to be false and we're going to jump back to state two. So actually, we're going to have two, three, and four active in the next cycle. And in the cycle after that, we're going to have two, three, four, and five active. And then we're going to be in a steady state for a little while with two, three, and four, two, three, four, and five active. And we're going to get something that looks like this, right? Each of these groups of states, each of these two, three, four, fives, is a <coughs> um, one instance of or one iteration of the loop body, right? Um, and there's a bunch of different transitions here. But actually, if you look, all except for one transition in any given cycle um, are transitions that are unconditional. So if you think about it, 
this chain that goes from 0 to 2 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 and so on is the chain of state transitions that corresponds to the branches in the loop. And all of these transitions from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 and so on, um, each of these sort of transitions in a straight line on this diagram, correspond to unconditional transitions from one data processing instruction in a basic block to the next. And so with this optimization, we've been able to crush together many of the iterations of the loop um, so that we're actually overlapping not only data processing instructions in the same basic block, but different data processing instructions in different instances of the same basic block. And the result, as you can see in this chart, is a huge improvement in performance. Instead of starting the second iteration of the loop down here, we're starting it up here. So pipelining is an incredibly powerful optimization. Um, and now, as I mentioned, we've got many data processing instructions from multiple basic blocks active in the same cycle. And notice that each instruction still starts after its data dependencies. And only one basic block has an unfinished terminator instruction at any given cycle. So going back to this diagram, um, here at the start, the only basic block with a terminator instruction outstanding is the entry block. Here, the entry block is finished, and the only uh, basic block with an outstanding instance of the basic block, excuse me, with an outstanding terminator instruction is the basic block for the first iteration of the loop, and then for the second, third, fourth, fifth. And so notice actually that if you were to open up these states and print out the instructions that were executing in each cycle, what we would see is that many of the data processing instructions in this loop are now executing out of order, um, or in a, you know, it's a slightly different order than they would in the sequential program. But all of the branch instructions in the program are executing relative to one another in the same order that they would in a single-threaded program. And that's actually very important because it means that even a pipelined processor is not a distributed system. It doesn't have multiple simultaneous flows of control, um, and so it can't starve or deadlock. But if you don't know what that means, uh, don't worry about it too much. It just means pipelining is, uh, is a safe optimization that isn't going to cause uh, starvation or deadlock. So every instruction starts after its data dependencies, and only one basic block is an unfinished terminator instruction in a given cycle. Um, but we can overlap a huge number of data processing instructions and get a massive boost in performance compared to uh, the processors that just overlap data processing instructions in the same instance of the same basic block. So pipelining is an amazing optimization, but it's actually not always possible. And so next time we're going to talk about why pipelining is sometimes impossible, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we can do to try to avoid situations where pipelining is impossible. So I'll see you next time.